Welcome to Season 2 of You and Me Kid, a podcast about starting and raising a family on your own, where I speak with other single moms, those still considering, and experts in relevant fields to give you a real sense of what the day-to-day experience of solo parenting looks and feels like. So wherever you are in the process, I hope this podcast provides some support, helpful info, and most importantly, humor. Thanks so much for listening. Now let's get to it. Hello. I'm so excited about today's episode. I am talking to Emily, who I spoke to in season one. She happens to be my best friend, a nurse practitioner, a hospital-based midwife, and a mother of four. Emily is my go-to resource for pretty much any subject, but on today's episode, we talk about three major parenting categories that I have thought a lot about in the last 20 months. The first is how to prepare and manage sickness as a solo parent. We also talk about travel hacks for flying solo with kiddos. And finally, we talk about stuff. Not only when stuff comes in in the early days after the baby comes, but how we transition stuff out of our homes as our kids get older. Emily is always a wealth of helpful information as well as humor, and I hope you enjoy our chat as much as I did. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. As you know, this season I partnered up with California Cryobank, the number one sperm bank in the U.S. California Cryobank ships to over 40 countries and has one of the largest and most diverse selection of donors out there. They are offering my listeners an amazing deal for season two that gives you free access to their level two subscription, which lets you check out baby and adult photos of the donors. To use this code, visit cryobank.com or click the link in the episode description and use my promo code YOUMEKID, Y-O-U-M-E-K-I-D, for a free level two subscription to their donor catalog. California Cryobank has helped tens of thousands create the family of their dreams, and hopefully you're next. Now, let's get back to it. Did I tell you that you're one of the most downloaded episodes of season one? I mean... I'm so floored with that compliment. I almost can't take it. I don't believe it. And it's probably just my mom downloading them on multiple devices. So today I want to talk about three big buckets. These are the three big buckets I think I thought about a lot prior to pursuing single parenthood and had questions about like how I would handle these things. Mm -hmm. Those categories are travel, Mm -hmm. thickness, and stuff is bonus category number three. Got it. Okay. These are my three favorite topics in, um, in addition to my favorite topic, which is reproduction, human reproduction. <laughs> yeah, which we already talked about. We already talked about. So we're moving on. Great. Okay. We're on, we're on to your next three favorite topics. So maybe let's talk about travel first, because this is okay. a question I do actually get quite a bit from people. Going into having a baby, I was nervous the most about security. Like, mm. how do I get a baby through security? And you have helped me really understand that. And we're going to dive into that. I was also really nervous about at a 30,000 foot level, would I not be able to travel in the way or to the places that I wanted to as someone who really loves adventures? And we have a a very special friend who often uses the phrase, my life is over. I'm never going to travel anymore (laughs) after having a kid. And so I, I thought about that a little bit. I now know that's not true, but let's kind of, let's go through your hacks as a non-single mom, but a mom who travels often with multiple children and someone who I think really thinks through the hacks every step of the way. But is there anything that you think about in terms of where you're going and how you're going to get there? Yes. So I really like to travel. I like to travel before I had kids and I continue to like to travel. When I'm planning travel, you know, spring break doesn't become such a thing until you have school age kids. And I think it doesn't even really become a thing until you have school age kids in which attending school matters more. <laughs> yeah. I hope no one from my kids' school listens to this after. I hope none of their teachers hear me be like, it doesn't really matter. That first grade teacher was really skippable. Yeah. For kindergarten, first grade, please. You don't need to go to those. Preschool, get real. Um And so when we look at, when I look at planning travel, I look at two things. We do look at cost because we're a family of six. And so that's a really real, that's something that's real. And then I really look at places, and this is my honest, 100% honest opinion. 
I have a belief that when I'm having a good time, everyone's having a good time. There are exceptions to this rule, but it really is true. So I prefer to go places that I enjoy. And then I find that if I enjoy them, everyone enjoys them rather than plan something that just my kids will enjoy, enjoy and I might feel sort of frustrated or annoyed by. I love I, that. I really like busy outside children. And so I tend to plan things that are both busy and outside. Those are the three sort of factors I look at when planning a trip. When I know, because I know you very well, that you love, a, you love a red eye. You I love, love a red eye. I love, love a red eye. eye. And, <laughs> and we're not going to make that recommendation on the podcast. That's just like, I can't. that's just awful. But mm-hmm. when you do fly alone with the kiddos, uh-huh. and I'm thinking, mm-hmm. you know, a lot about those early days when you flew with the twins when they were babies. Yep. How were you picking flight times if it wasn't price? I was only picking on price. And only I price. St- okay. I still only pick on price. I don't know if I can, um, in good conscience, recommend that to everybody, but I truly pick only on price and fly at horrible times. And your family has been okay with that though, right? Like they've kind of rolled with it or do you, is it, has it just been awful, but it's worth saving two grand because everyone bounces back the next day? So I think there's two things. One, I'm a, I'm really a morning person and really a person who I think because I'm a midwife and so I have lots of practice with like being up at odd hours, having to be focused. I feel like I have the ability to wake up at three in the morning and be like, it's game time. You know what I'm up for? Airport security. Yeah. It honestly works better, this is a horrible statement, without my husband. Here's why. Guess who's not a guess who's not a morning person? My husband. Guess who is the fussiest of the six of us on a morning flight? My husband. And so sometimes I'll pick something a little bit later, like not at 5.30, but more at 8.30, if I know that my husband will be with us and the cost isn't a huge difference because he is grumpy. If you know yourself and you know you're grumpy in the morning, don't do it. Because I think that having a winning attitude at the airport is truly half the battle. It's the same concept as the location you were just saying, right? Like Like, I have to to make yourself happy. Yes. Because you are the like foundation of this ship and your kids are going to like figure it out one way or the other. And feed off my energy a little bit. And so I always think that on travel or kind of in life, I have to be, I have to make myself sturdy. So then like whatever swirling children are around me, I'm, I'm up for that. And so I'm patient. I am patient with my children and I'm patient with like TSA. And so at 530 in the morning, that works for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but I just do it purely on cost so that I can stretch our travel budget. God, I really... You've never said that to me, but I really, really love that idea, even as it, as it relates to the location, because mm-hmm. I think a lot of the advice I get sometimes, or even not even advice, I was just literally just listening to a podcast the other day where they were going through all these resorts that have childcare. Oh, I don't resort. Right. So I don't either. And so part of my brain was like, oh, that's a great option. And then immediately it was like, wait, that's not, that's not the type of travel that I personally enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so- I think you make just such a good point, which is like, go to the places that like, you're going to enjoy. You're still going to have a great time. Your kids are going to be like nimble or they're not. There's no way for you to know the difference between like that place you chose a versus like other place. And the flights are kind of the same, like take care of yourself. That is really what I think. And the other thing is, you know, childcare is there are some places I think, especially as a single mom, if you really want to feel after a vacation, your cup filled, if you're a person who really needs like your child to be in the child care at the resort. So you can like go out on a scuba dive. I don't really know what people do at resorts. Go out on a scuba dive. Then you should absolutely do that. It's just not what I like. Yeah, totally. No, I think that's a great point. Okay. My absolute favorite part of this is the day, the travel day hacks. Mm. Let's talk about it. Let me stress. Pre pre going to the airport. What do you, does your kit matter? Have you thought through when you're alone with the kids? Yeah. So I'm flying alone. You're flying alone. Do the tools matter of like, you know, does the diaper bag matter? Did it back in the day? Mm -hmm. Do you have other little things that you use to like get from home to the airport and make it easier? Yes. I think that's really relevant. So I will, I'm not a single mom. 
but I will say that I do fly without my husband a lot. One, because he's fussy. Two, as I previously true. discussed. <laughs> Cut that out. By choice. You're a solo <laughs> mom traveler by choice. I'm a solo mom traveler by choice. No, it's just the nature of his work and my work that I can take the kids places without him a lot. So I'm going to go, I'm going to think back to when I was flying alone with babies, right? Because that's the majority of your audience because school age kids are a little bit different. So yes, I would do a lot of preparing. My, what I always want to do is like not have a lot of clutter with me. So I want to be like as hands-free and mobile as possible. A lot of that was things like if I'm going to, was going to go see my parents, is there a possibility that they ha- can have a car seat for me so I can fly without a car seat? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But if they could, that's so helpful. Is it possible that somebody can pick me up from the airport? I find being picked up from the airport upon arrival is way easier because everyone's tired from the flight. So I can, if I can have somebody pick me up from the airport, that's fantastic. If not, that's okay too. And then again, packing those bags with a lot of novelty. So I try to save things for airplanes, even when the kids were little, that they never get out of airplanes. So I would always bring like a new toy they'd have never seen, a new sticker book they've never seen, a snack they don't get a lot, so mm-hmm. that there's just novelty. And in my mind, those things are only for inside the airplane buckled in your seat. You can't use it at the airport because the airport's too entertaining. So don't lose your willpower an hour before the flight because no, an hour before that flight, you should only be walking repeatedly on magic sidewalks. And which my kids really like, or they still really like them, honestly. And window shopping at a Hudson News, which is what we do at the airport exclusively. And they love a Hudson News. They make a whole Christmas list there. I love this. Okay. So when you do have to take a car seat. Yep. And you're alone, Mm -hmm. like car to airport, how do you do it? Okay, car to airport. The thing that I always put in my mind is that the car to checking in your flight is the hardest time, in my opinion. Yeah. So I also just kind of gear myself up for that, right? I'm like, this is going to be really unpleasant and I'm going to get through it and it might, and I'm just going to survive it. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be efficient. I get nothing fun about anything and there's no way to make it fun. No. And it's interesting because now that I have, you know, my oldest kids are nine and one of my daughters is always like, I hate security. And I'm always like, it should not be an expectation in your mind that you like security. If your favorite part of your trip is security, what a bad trip. So we just, that's a bad trip. So we just survived this. She also really, as we've traveled more internationally, she also really hates customs. So we survived this part and we don't have the expectation that it's going to be fun to like get through it. And that's how I feel about the car to the, that's actually how I feel about the majority of the travel logistics. So two things, if you have a baby that's still in a car seat, like the kind you use for two and under, you can either travel with the base or on the bottom of every car seat is this little piece that's shaped like an H that you can use to install a car seat in a car without the base. So if you have the kind of stroller that's just the car seat and you don't want to travel with the base of your car seat, just take that little piece out and make sure you bring it with you. Are we parking at a a shuttle lot in this scenario? Yeah, let's make it as hard as possible. 100%. Okay, I get to the shuttle lot. I'm at the airport so far in advance. It's borderline comical. Yep. Six, I mean, like three hours. Six hours. I'm like half a day. I'm there 48 hours um, same. Right. To get on that airport shuttle. I'm I'm going to pretend we have a baby. I'm going to put a baby in a carrier. Okay. And then I'm going to push my stroller that I'm going to have in the airport. Ideally you have a car seat stroller, but maybe not. The reason that I'm going to do that is because when getting on that shuttle, I really want to be able to be rough with the stroller. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like jam it up the rail. And it's hard to do that with an actual baby in it. Yeah. That's similar to my kid. So I have, and these are things to think about too, I think when picking a stroller, if you have yes. options, mm-hmm. which is the car seat that goes right into the stroller, the stroller mm-hmm. base goes down. Some of the cheapest and best strollers have those options. Mm-hmm. And then 
I will do the same. I'll put all my bags in the base of the stroller, mm -hmm. put Ellie in the car seat, and then put a backpack on if needed, or like that's my diaper bag. And then everything goes away by the time we're on the plane, except the diaper bag. I'm with you. I don't want any stuff. I'm not putting something overhead. I'm like, my kit by the time we're sitting in our seat is so streamlined. Yes. The more stuff in your seat, the more hectic your life. That I really, really agree with. The other thing is getting on the shuttle. I really remember this because I used to travel. This is so random, but when my when my twins were between nine months and 18 months, we flew by ourselves like six or seven times for my work. And that was like a very hectic time. The other thing that you sometimes that I had to find peace with is I'm going to be the most rookie traveler getting on the shuttle and it's going to feel inconvenient to other people or I'm going to perceive that or I felt insecure about that and I needed to just get over that right so like yes I'm not just going to be able to push on the shuttle in one step I might need to like put my suitcase on the shuttle and then go get the babies and then bring the babies on the shuttle and I just had to be okay with people kind of rolling their eyes at me whether and that might have not even happened and it might have been my own insecurity but I do think you're not at your max efficiency when you're traveling as a single mom or as traveling alone yes. as the adult with a baby. Yeah. Which I agree is like a tough transition for very efficient travelers. Yes. When you pride yourself on your travel efficiency, yes. throw it out the window. Yeah. yeah. yeah totally throw it out agree. the window. Throw it out okay. the window. Let's talk about security. Cause you gave me some really good hacks about this. Oh, um, heading into the line. There are some things. Let's talk about this first. A, you can always bring breast milk or milk in a bottle, correct? The yes. You can tell me about the legality of that. Okay. So you can always bring breast milk or milk in a bottle or formula or the distilled water you might be using to make your formula. That's All a those liquids, nobody can argue with you. If they argue with you, push back. Yeah, you can for sure push back. And the other thing that I used to do when I was traveling with breast milk is, which you might travel with one if you're going to be if you want to feed your baby pumped milk on the airplane, or if you're traveling without your baby, like for work or on a girl's trip and you're pumping milk and then bringing it back. What I used to do is I printed out the TSA thing that had it, that would said it was okay. Or I screenshotted it on my phone. Cause the thing that I always thought is I never want to get in a power struggle with anyone on TSA. Cause even so though true. I know I'm right. Ultimately, I also know that my plane's going to take off. And I mean, I'm at the airport so early, I'm, I'm aware that my plane's eventually going to take off and they, they have all the power, right? Cause they need to let me through. And I think that people are genuinely trying to do the right thing and trying to do their jobs and just don't know so that I'm there to make sure that they know that they can let me through. Did so you ever have to show it? Only one time. Okay. And I had, when I used to fly with my twins, because I used to, I breastfed and I could feed, it was hard on an airplane plane for me to simultaneously nurse them which is called tandem feeding. So I used to breastfeed one and then bottle feed the other. Cause I could do that. I could like logistic. I could, that it's I could manage. It's so insane. It's so insane. But do you know what's helpful to travel by yourself to be five feet tall? Cause I, I can just going to say the fact that you can sit with your legs crossed in a seat. Yeah. I think about that every time I sit in a plane seat and I'm like, oh, cause I'm I can crazy. sit. Yeah. It's cause I can sit crisscross applesauce in an airplane seat, breastfeed a baby. It was only when he was like, you can't bring this liquid. And so then I was like, oh, I printed this out from this TSA website. I can. And then he brought a supervisor over and then they read it and then they agreed. But I just was so grateful that I had that. Yeah. I love that idea as a backup. And it's just like some relief because like the first time I walked through, I remember being like, okay, what's going to happen? Like what questions yes. are they going to ask me? What mm -hmm. are they going to ask me to do that I no longer have hands for? So basically like I go into security. This is regardless of my child's age. And you figure out the order of operations. So for me, the order of operations mm -hmm. is based on the buttons. The car seat comes out of the stroller. Um, it goes on the floor, not on the thing, because they'll stop the thing and they'll say baby on the whatever. Yeah. So I put her on the floor. I put the handle down, pull her out. Mm -hmm. And I flip the car seat over. It goes, it goes upside down on the thing and I push it through. My stroller does not, it doesn't uh, shrink down and go into the x-ray. It gets rolled through by a TSA person. I've never mm -hmm. had anybody question me about it. Mm -hmm. The one thing that you brought up that I've actually never had anybody ask, which is 
are they ever going to ask if the wheels come off? Tell me about that and what you're allowed to do. This what- happens. It might be the nature of the stroller. So they sometimes ask if you can break down your stroller and take off the wheels to put it through security. My opinion on that is that that's a no. And yeah. so I just say the wheels don't come off. Here's the thing. Do I know if the wheels come off? I don't know. I've never yeah. tried. And they don't really care. I feel like, like they just want no. me through. They don't want to no. deal with me. I did have someone the last time they looked at the stroller and I, I thought that the next question was to be, did the wheels come off? And he said, do you have anyone traveling with you? And I said, no. And I could see his brain be like, I'm not going to ask this woman to take the wheels off. But if they ask, I just say no. Um, and they don't really like, they don't want to deal with it either, I think. But yeah, you'll yeah. figure out your system for what happens first. I also have to say every single time I've been through security, which is quite a bit in the past 20 months, somebody offers to help me. And if they didn't, I 100% at this point in my parenting would feel comfortable asking someone to help me if I oh, needed yeah. it. Like, hey, yeah. can you just like push these buttons on this? And people are so stoked to be helpful in that in like what is like just an awful part of your travel journey anyway. I've uh-huh. noticed like everybody, there's somebody in line that has a kid and somebody that knows how your stroller works and they're going to offer to help. So ask yes. for help or say yes to the offer if you need it. It's actually pretty efficient. I thought I do have TSA pre I've been through non TSA pre lines and it's like not that big of a deal. You pull your stuff out. No problem. And again, the goal at the end of it is to be back to that, back to that very streamlined kit and not have like stuff falling everywhere all over the place. Yes. That's the other thing is I make sure I roll into pre TSA pre-check like dialed. ready for pre. Yeah. So like, like when we get to yes. the airport, my kids know now, like we dump out all our water bottle. I mean, when we, before we enter the airport, when we're still outside, water bottles are empty. If you're traveling with a device, like I pre pull it out. I used yes. to, cause sometimes, cause again, I had twins. So it was a little tricky. I would always put the baby like in the, I would have the carrier on and put the baby in the carrier before I got in line. And then my other hack in terms of asking for help, if there is a, I rolling huffy traveler behind me. I let them go ahead of me for two reasons. One, I think as kids get older, it models manners. And now sometimes my older kids in line will be like, should we let all these people ahead of us? And now I'm like, no, they're not rolling our eyes. And we're actually a finely oiled machine. They're not, but I don't want that added pressure. And so I would just rather let you go ahead of me, go ahead. Like, and then I think people are sometimes surprised because they were sort of committed to being annoyed with you. And then you could be like, oh my God, go ahead. I have plenty of time. You go. Yeah. Just call the ball. Like we're a hot mess. This is going to take me a second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I haven't really had like any issues, but I'm, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's the mentality of like, I'm not as efficient as I used to be. This is going to take me a second and I might mess up my program. I might forget that this button is this button. And that's 90% of the time the the case and that's okay. And I'm just going to be that slow person that used to annoy me back in the day and it's totally okay. And then on the rare chance that I nail it, like everything's ready to go. I'm not taking anything out. I hit the right buttons. I take the right piece of the thing out in the right time. It's like I've won the mom game. 100%. And I I assume people are looking at me like she's a pro. She's a pro. Here's another thing if you have a toddler. Sometimes toddlers have trouble when you have to put their backpack, like when a toddler becomes attached to their backpack on security, because it feels like you're taking it away. So then that happened to me once. And I've seen it happen to other parents in the airport. So now when we're standing in line, we, and the day before I'm like, now remember, we go through the security. They're the ones who keep us safe. We're going to take your backpack off. And then we like practice putting it on a table and then you'll get it back at the end so that it doesn't feel like the toddler has a backpack filled with all their most prized possessions. This is when they're old enough to be aware of their backpack, like 18 yeah. months to three, that then you're being like, give it to this man. And they're like, absolutely not. Yeah. And you're already in a crowd. I'm just turning the corner of my child being able to understand some of those preset expectations. Oh, yeah. So because you're there so early, you have the time to be like, here's what's going to happen. And I don't know if my child totally gets it, but I like that I'm telling her that. Yes. Like, 
you know, we got it. We're going to wait in a line for a second. Like, I know this is hard, blah, blah, blah. And it hel it helps me just as much as it helps her, right? You're kind of like telling them what you need to tell your own brain. But it hasn't been at all as hard as I thought it would be security. And then in Denver, we, of course, have like the train and the shuttles and like it's it's a whole hoopla. The yeah. one other thing I would say, too, and I'm I'm assuming you do this is that planning your bag and the kit for security then in my world gets revamped for the flight. So mm. while we're in the gate, when I had a little baby because I didn't breastfeed, I then revamped. So like then the bottle gets made and it gets put in the oh, yes. bag. Totally. Like the pacifier is like easy to pull out. So I would I got a different bag, thanks to you, that I felt like I could get stuff out of when it was under the seat in front of me while holding a baby. And like bottles just needed water from the flight attendant. Right. I didn't have to like pour the formula, whatever. So those were ready to go. That felt really good and efficient. And then anything I was going to need with her, like if she was going to fall asleep, I needed like a jacket or a blanket or something for her head was ready to pull out or I could put in the little net thing prior to yeah. me sitting down. Yes, that is. A, that's exactly what I do. I don't travel with again. I always I check bags. I pay to check bags because I don't want it with me in the airport. Um, and then I make everything. This is exactly what you're saying within arm's reach, because in the, hopefully a baby's going to fall asleep on top of me. And there's no worse feeling than being like, I either have to wake up this baby. Yes. I can, I can reach my earbuds, but then I have to wake up this baby. And which one do I want more? And then just like sitting silently on a plane for two hours is actually kind of hard. Yeah. And I mean, I think the expectations I've learned too, because my kiddo used to sleep like off and on on the plane before, but now She's old enough where all the beeping and the announcements wake her up. Yeah. And it's a similar type of expectation, I think, which is like, this is going to be hard. If it's yes. not hard, what a win. But what a win. It's likely going to be hard. Yeah. And like, I've gotten stuck on the tarmac for five hours. I've like, I've gone through some travel challenges and it's just difficult. But as you would say, and I think about this all the time, it's like that plane is going to land, like it's going to be over and you just have to get through it. And yeah. that's true. It's going to be over and you just have to get through it. And then I would say most of the time it goes better than my brain assumed it would go. Yes. And then we're walking out of the airport and someone's picking us up and we're like, nailed it or didn't nail it. But like, it's over. It's over. It's, it's over. over. And we're in a, the place that we wanted to go. And like, that was worth going to the place and seeing people or having an adventure or whatever. It's always worth it. Even the day we spent five hours on the tarmac. I will say the day we did spend five hours on the tarmac. All the families bonded together yes. because it sucked for everybody. Um, I turned on the screen. There was no sound. My child, like, binge screen time. No big deal. And then all the families, we boarded and off-boarded the plane twice in those five hours. Mm -hmm. And we, like, got a glass of wine together. Like, the families, like, just kind of, like, bonded. Like, people were sharing snacks. There are some light sides of humanity, I think, in those harder moments. Yes. I really do think that. Yeah. Um, okay, last part about travel, and then I want to switch to sickness. In terms of getting there, yeah, you kind of said, like, pick a place that you like, and then the kids will enjoy the activities. Anything that you think is, like, a smart tip for once you get to a place, sleeping, trying to get them in vacation mode, and making your life as easy as possible once you get there? Or is it just a freestyle show always? It's not a freestyle show. I would say, wait, can I say one other thing about an airplane that I like yeah. to do that I really think is fun is I used to, when my kids were like that age where they want to move, but they're unreasonable still. So, you know, if they're not old enough for screens, so kind of like that under two time, but they're mobile, I think that's a really hard time to fly. Two things. One, I used to pack a Z gallon Ziploc bag with just a lot of stuff in it. My number one thing I used to pack is band-aids. Why? Because not my kids like nothing more than opening band-aids. Why? I don't know. But they you're won't. not the first person to tell me that. Or painters tape. Oh yeah, they anything. can just like stick tape everywhere. Just anything and stuff they've never seen before. So I have this one egg game that they really like. That's only for airplanes, but stuff that's novel. So I would like, and you know, markers are hard because if you drop your marker, which you will, because the plane is uneven, your toy is gone within nine seconds, and it's so sad. Yes, that is. Yes. I'm so glad you brought that up. It's really a sad time. Well, because I've like definitely brought new markers and then lost them all probably within like 37 seconds of opening them and been like, party's over. 
I learned really early the like thing that connects the pacifier to my child's clothing is clutch. Some very smart mom told me to bring that prior to our first flight. It saved us because my child will try to throw her pacifier at everyone throughout the flight. And that, yes. that is one thing that does make the flight easier for my child. Yes. Um, but things that will like stick or not just get lost because they, yeah, everything gets thrown or moved or whatever. And um, so, yeah, things that are connected, I think is a great idea. Here's one other thing that I remember I didn't know before I flew for the first time. You can't have a baby in a carrier during takeoff or landing. Mm. Do you remember this? Which if they're asleep. I never, my, Ellie was never a carrier baby, but oh. um, if you have to wake them up, that's a real bummer moment. It's a real bummer. So I would use a carrier that I could take down and leave them chest to chest with me, but I could just take down the carrier to satisfy the flight attendant. Oh, smart. So if they were asleep, maybe they would like rustle, but it wasn't like you were totally moving them. Yeah. So like I used to wear my babies in Moby's a lot. Remember those big wraps? And then those you really can't undo and redo. With a something like a Bjorn or an Ergo, you can unclip it. So they're not in it anymore, but they, you don't have to move their position. Oh, I love that hack. Okay. <laughs> when you get to a place, well, I, I do want to run through one thing. My very, very first flight, the flight lost my car seat. And in oh. that moment, I learned a hack and I, I wanted you to revisit that for me, which is my initial reaction was go to a rental car place because they probably have car seats. But you told me that the airlines have them. The airlines have them. If they break your car seat or lose your car seat, the airline has them. And so you just need to go and then they give you a car seat. We actually still have a booster seat from an airline because they were like, oh, we have so many of those. Don't bring it back. So go to like the lost baggage lady. Go to the lost baggage thing. Okay. And that's the same thing that if they lose your stroller, they'll re they replace your stroller. Or they but give not you in the moment. The stroller, they don't the replace. car seat they have to give you because you can't the leave. car seat, they have, to re they have to give you a car seat. And then so, you can rent car seats with car rentals, correct? You can rent car seats with car rentals. You can, um, for like a pretty nominal fee. So you can rent car seats with car rentals. And if they break anything, just make sure you fill out the little form so that they give you money for it. Okay. Here's the thing I just saw, which is interesting and a bit terrifying, is in Europe, car seats are not required. And U.S. car seats don't meet the standards of European car seats. So they you can't take them. So anyway... I need to look into the legalities of that before I go to Europe. But there's some weird like car seats and taxi things in Europe that one should look into. Yes. Yes. OK. Yeah. That was that was a moment where I was like, oh, I didn't think about what to do here. But that's super helpful. So airlines have car seats. And then when you get to a place in terms of getting your kids on the new program, is there anything that you do? I would say the only other thing I do is set my expectation that our first night of sleep in a new place usually isn't awesome. And so the only reason I do that is it just helps me. A lot of my parenting acts are about like keeping me emotionally stable yeah. so that it's not the first night of vacation when everyone, what my kids tend to do, all four of them is they wake up really early on vacation the first night. And so then I'm like, never, no one's ever going to sleep again. And then I just have to be like, no, this is our first night. This is what happens every single first night. Yeah. Ever, every vacation we've ever taken. But I don't know. What else? No, I think that's accurate. I think like I try to stick with the same bedtime routine. So my kid, even oh, though yeah. she might be in a different time zone, like she knows that it's bedtime. I haven't done this because we haven't gone on like a quote unquote vacation, but like Airbnbs, a lot of times you can get a pack and play. You can rent like all kinds of stuff from like really good Airbnb people. Airbnb people have a lot of things. But yes. there's also a bunch of services that will like deliver you rental stuff. So in terms of minimizing that stuff, you don't actually have to take all the things. You can get really streamlined if you're willing to pay that extra fee for it to be there when you get there. Yes. And we really, we also specifically won't rent an Airbnb that doesn't provide a pack and play. Yep. Yeah. Um, good rule. Okay. It just, there's so many Airbnbs. It's rare that you're like, this is the only Airbnb in San Francisco. And so I would just rather get one that has a pack and play and has, you know, when my kids were little enough to need to eat, like in sort of some sort of mechanism yes, that had a high chair. Yeah. And that just made my life easier. Yeah. And you don't have to pack all the things. Yeah. yeah okay. Also, I want a family-friendly Airbnb that also has plastic cups 
so that I'm not serving my child out of like their Christmas Christmas goblet. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. feels so stressful to me because I don't want them to break the Airbnb. Yeah. Ellie got RSV when she was four months old. We hadn't had a sickness prior to that. So I hadn't really thought about a lot of things and we figured it out. But I remember making a call to you and I want to start with this, which is this call actually happened with my preeclampsia, but we can put that aside for a second, which was. I don't remember this call, so I can't wait to hear what it was. Well, well, I remember very clearly thinking in my head when I was having preeclampsia my first night home from the hospital, which was, I can't breathe. I said, just go to the gas station and get one of those like oxygen things that they give oh. out at ski resorts. Okay. I for sure remember that call that you're like, yeah. Hey, I can't breathe. And my heart is racing. I yeah. might just get an oxygen tank and swing by an urgent care, like yeah. attack inside of a, inside of a King Supers grocery store. And yeah. I said, it's a hard no. I said no. So let me, so let's break this down because I think this is really helpful. And I still like, I still think about this. Okay. Talk me through if you do need additional support, if this isn't something you can do in your home, and we'll talk about the home stuff in a second. Sure. When you go to an urgent care, when do you go to a hospital? When do you call an ambulance? Ooh, good call. The first thing I have to say, because this you say this on all podcasts, even though I'm a medical, even though I'm a medical practitioner, I'm not anyone's listening medical practitioner. There's this doesn't count as medical advice and please seek the help of a trusted medical professional. Now moving on from that. Well done. I think that they're like, in terms of what are warning signs that you want to like the scary stuff, big red flags. Yeah. It's a little bit age dependent and kids under one are more vulnerable than kids over one. So kids just get sturdier and hardier as they get older. Um, And so for kids under one, I would say that any difficulty breathing, like if your baby looks like it's laboring to breathe, how a baby looks when they're laboring to breathe is you can see them sucking in at their ribs. The medical word for it is retracting. And if you Google image it or Google YouTube it, you'll see a thousand images of it. And then also if they're breathing noisy. So a baby shouldn't make noise on inspiration. Like (gasps) that's called inspiratory strider. That's a reason to go to an ER. Here, I think are great reasons for urgent cares. I would take a kid to an urgent care if I had something that I thought needed antibiotics and I need, and you have to show that in order to get treatment. So the majority of, you know, every kid gets six to eight colds a year. Those are usually during the winter months. So most babies are getting a cold a month in their first three years of life. And that is just, but doesn't that feel true? I mean, it is true, but doesn't it feel true just experience? Yeah. So if I think my baby has an ear infection, kids under two, they do recommend treating for ear infections. So ear infections are things like if your baby is running a fever. A fever is something above 100.4. So if you think your baby's running a fever and tugging on their ears, and I want to know if they have an ear infection because I want to treat with it, with that antibiotics, because they, it is not treating them can impact hearing, which can then impact speech, which is why it's treated both for two. I'm going to take you to an urgent care because it's so easily diagnosable. And if you can't get into your pediatrician within yeah. a timely manner, or it's the weekend, totally urgent so, care, no question, easy stop. Urgent care, no problem. Same with strep throat. If I think a kid has strep throat, strep often lives alone. So a kid doesn't have a, if a kid has a cold, they always have a sore throat. Strep throat is often a fever and a sore throat and sometimes nausea. So if I have a kid who I think has strep throat, I'm going to take them to an urgent care because I want a strep test so I can get antibiotics. Great. Okay. What about like cuts, like little stuff like that? Urgent care is fine. They can do stitches. Yeah. Urgent care can do fine. People have different opinions if there's something on the face Hmm. Um, because sometimes you want to, there are some people who would prefer to have something on the face repaired by a plastic surgeon so it doesn't scar. Um, That's a little parent dependent. So if you want, if you have a kid with a big cut on their face and you want it to not scar, then you often should take them to a children's hospital where they can have a pediatric plastic surgeon. sew it a kid with like a big gash on their arm that didn't stop bleeding and you thought needed stitches. So really deep, that would be a reason to take them in. And then probably if I thought a kid had a broken bone, I would take them to an ER because I would want it. I would want it. I would want someplace that I know I could get an x-ray. And you can't get an x-ray in urgent care. It depends on the urgent care, but I would want to go someplace where I know that I can get a pediatric ortho person. 
Got it. Got it. Okay. And then I have found one of my biggest like questions was how hard is it to get into my pediatrician? I think that it depends on the pediatrician. I think there are doctors who you can text the nurses. There are doctors who are open on the weekends. Like I didn't think about any of it when picking a pediatrician, but I have found when I call the day of line to get in, I actually haven't had any trouble. And, and that is even with like not crazy issues, but someone always calls me back in a timely manner and I get the answer that I need. And I have been able to get in when I needed to. And I now know that the backup for that would be an urgent care, which is great. But um, I haven't had, a, I haven't had a lot of trouble, but maybe something to chat with your pediatrician about prior to picking one is like, what's your communication strategy? If I need you, if I have a question and it's midnight, yes, what do I do, how do I get in after hour or like off hours, that sort of thing, I think is all good stuff to know, maybe prior to even having a baby. So, you know, the answer prior to like it being 1am and you're Googling because that's what yeah. we I think that I would say that in picking a pediatrician, that would probably be my first most important question was what's, how do I communicate with you if I need to see you the same day? Yeah. And I, you, you made this point to me really early when, when Ellie had RSV, which is like, and at that point, the entire world had RSV and there was, I think an eight hour wait at our pediatric hospital. And you made a great point, which is you have a four month old baby. And if she can't breathe, like you're not going to have to advocate that hard when you get to the ER. Like they, if you tell them those things, if you're clear about my baby's not breathing, she's four months old, they're going to help move that process forward. Just get her there. And that yes. gave me some relief that they would be able to prioritize it. We wouldn't yes. just like get put in a queue, which is what I thought would happen. Oh yeah. No, there's at every pediatric ER, at every ER in the world, there's someone who works triage which you, when you go up to the line, like determines the order in which you'll be seen. And a baby that can't breathe is at the top of the list. Yeah. And the, I think that it's smart for us to focus on that first year, because I do feel like even after six months, I have a pretty good sense of, is she yeah. sick? Is she not sick? Does she have a fever? Does she not have a fever? Like you just kind of figure out pretty quickly, but those early days, I wasn't always, especially going through something like RSV so early uh, I was a little bit like, Ooh, what do I do here? Is this a hospital thing? Is it not? And I, that was one of those moments where I was like, I didn't even want a partner there to like help with it. It was more like, Hey, she's crying. It would be nice to have somebody in the car with me. If I'm driving to a doctor, like to hold her, or if it's a respiratory thing, like I'm driving and she's in the back, but we, we figured it out thanks to, you know, having some good friends in healthcare and my pediatrician, I kind of like the idea, like what you just said, knowing your kid's going to get sick in that first year and in the first six months and being like, okay, don't wait till the moment they get a cold and they're three months old to figure out what your plan is. Like kind of know what you're going to do or where you're going to go generally prior to it happening. And then I would say there's a, there are some few things you might want to have on hand at home to when those things happen because they will happen. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I feel like my go-to things that I have at home is I have a thermometer that I trust so that I know that I can know if my, if my child has a fever and if so, how high, and then, and then know that I can bring it down with Tylenol or ibuprofen if they're over six months. So I know that I have a fever and I know that I can track, bring it down. Humidifiers are incredible. Yeah. Um, and so I know that I have a good humidifier that I can use, especially because we live in Colorado where the air is so dry for any respiratory stuff. Um, I know that some people really like what, like a nasal sucker that yeah. clears nasal passageways. You would like those. Yes. You know, someone gave me the, uh, Frida. No, no. Frida. And then my mom, when I was a kid used like just the bulb, like the bulb old sucker. not sucking bulb. I didn't actually, I used it only when Ellie had RSV because I knew that like within seconds I could clear her airway a little bit more in the middle of the night. And that made me feel really good. I have not used it since. Yes. Yes. Or anything. But in those moments, I was happy to have it. Absolutely. So it's like, why not have that on hand? I think having Tylenol that you know how to dose appropriately. Tylenol is a medication that when they're under two, you, it's a weight-based dosing that you'll get from your pediatrician. And so you want to know how to give your baby Tylenol, how you get it in their bodies, and then what the right dose is and how often you give it, which yeah. would... Did you get that from your pediatrician on all your discharge instructions? 
Yeah. And I like often forget the dosing because my child turns out continues to grow and I just Google it. Yeah. Like UCLA has it and University of St. Louis has it. They don't put it on the back of the Tylenol. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Until two. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's interesting. So like, this is one of those things that I didn't think about, but somebody very smart, instead of getting you like that cute stuffed animal or whatever, somebody gave me a pack of these things as a baby gift. It was like the, the, baby. T- the Tylenol, the snot sucker. I already had a humidifier, but a humidifier would have been like such an ideal addition to that, you know? And I think like having those, cause you, especially as a single mom, the thought of taking my child outside in the winter, which is what it was, to a Walgreens to buy those things at one o'clock in the morning when she's screaming just wouldn't have happened. Uh, so I had the solution. So like, buy that stuff. Yes, buy that stuff. You don't have a partner that can go grab it. Yes, yes. You can also Uber Eats it to your house, but- Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. but it is harder. That's just, don't do that. Just get yeah, it. Yeah, just have it. Just be ready. And then how's it going to happen and be ready? Yeah. And then the other thing that I think is important that I found really stressful, especially when my babies were little, because I was always surprised that they got sick. And I don't know why, because I knew that they would, is what's your work plan? Like, do you have the kind of, like, how do you call in sick to work? Great point. And what's your, if you have a nanny, what's your, what's your nanny's comfort with a sick kid? What's your daycare's comfort with a sick kid, which will probably be zero. And so if you have a kid in daycare and you can't take them to work, sort of like, what's the plan for that? So that the first time your baby's sick, you're not also trying to have a conversation with a nanny or a boss being like, I have a sick kid. What do I do? Yeah. I want to talk about fevers just for a second, because you did hit on colds. I think that colds, I don't know. I feel like they're just a little bit more obvious in terms of like, turn on the humidifier, give them some Tylenol. Fevers felt a little bit more stressful to me because my baby's level of discomfort was higher and it's just a little bit scarier. And there's so much subjectivity between me, my childcare and uh, the medical community about what a fever is. So Uh, talk to me about fevers in the first year and what is scary and what is not. So I can only speak for the medical community. That's right. I like them. Not speak for the opinion of your daycare. Right. Well, My daycare well, has different honest. rules. Yeah. yeah. So a fever is above 100.4. So 100.4. That's 38 degrees Celsius. Anything below that is not a fever. Okay. That is. That's, yes. Even if that's your daycare like, says it is. Even if your daycare. <laughs> that is one of the things also I think, you know, this gets in a little bit later, but I started my child at daycare at four months, like the first day of the fourth month. So basically three, yeah. three months. And I didn't read through in the packet, which I had signed a year before at that point, the rules around sickness and what the time frames were. And so I had to go back and reference it in the moment, which of course, like as a single parent, who like, isn't much of us, like, I'm not a super like stressed out person, but there's just no capacity in those moments when you have a sick baby that's crying that you're holding to seek out a lot of information. And Great so point. having it and your brain, like postpartum, like my brain just like couldn't process a lot of stuff at a lot of speed. So having that stuff either available or a friend um, to text, I think was really, really helpful or a pediatrician to text. But I think um Finding that was really difficult for me. And I had a couple tough moments where I took her and then the rules were explained to me either in the moment while I was dropping her off or after I dropped her off. And so being clear, as you said, not only about work, but like, what's the nanny expectation? If they're in childcare, what's the childcare expectation? Like my child, if they have a fever, she can't come back for 48 hours. If it's like a stomach issue, it's one thing. A fever is, you know, a different thing. So just kind of understanding a little bit, again, it's going to happen. So be ready for it. And like, what else are you going to do in your eighth or ninth month of pregnancy? <laughs> then yeah. you're going <laughs> to nest. Yes. I would rather spend my time on those back to expectations than like making sure I had like a color coordinated stuffed animal collection, which a lot of people do. Yeah. These are the things to think about, right? Totally. And I, when we've hired babysitters or nannies, from it, what one of the things we've learned is sort of like how I don't go to an Airbnb that doesn't have a pack and play. I don't hire a nanny who's not comfortable taking care of some degree of sick child. 
Uh, if my child's really, really sick, I want to stay home with them. But most daycares, 48 hours is aggressive, but most daycares and all elementary schools have, you need to be 24 hour fever free. So that second day, they're really not sick. Yes. They can't yes. go to school or they can't go to daycare, but they're not sick. I needed to make sure that I hired babysitters that were comfortable being home with kids during those days because we have to go to work because yeah. we have to make money to feed all these children. Yeah. Yeah. Turns out. Turns uh, out. Okay. I want to ask you one question about stuff before we get there. Cause I know we're at time, but anything else that you would say for like to think about new parents, young babies and sickness hmm. to just kind of expect what is going to happen. I, th- I think that knowing who you can call, I think that anyone who lives in Denver, there are, you can, there's also mobile. The, my other favorite parenting hack that I feel like people don't do enough is, you know, Denver has a mobile urgent care that will come to your house and accepts almost all insurances. Have I not cool. told you about that? I nope, should be love like, that. Haven't needed it. Knock on wood, but good to oh, know. It's amazing. So like if you need a strep test, they can come to your house, do a strep test and give you the antibiotics and they come to your house. And so those are more common. So Google that and know all the things and then have all those phone numbers ready, right? Yes. Like yes. Put poison control in your phone as your kids get older. I call poison control. Not infrequently. <laughs> Good to know. Where I'm like, my two-year-old just ate a fair amount of lotion. What's yeah, the- What do I do? What it's do I like, do? This is the stuff I think, you know, There, it felt like at the end of my pregnancy, there was just time. Yes. Like, what do you do? And it's like, I food prepped. And that felt like a killer way to spend my time. Yeah. And I made sure I had diapers and wipes. And that's like kind of all you need. And, but these are things I didn't really do, but I'm lucky to have a lot of healthcare professionals in my life that I can text and get answers from. But this is how I would have spent those past couple of weeks. It's like, get the phone numbers. Who's your team? Ask your pediatrician a bunch of questions. Figure out where your nearest hospital is. Where's your nearest pediatric hospital? Like, just kind of know, don't stress, but know and have it available because you, you, you will not have the brain power or the energy to find that answer in the moment when it's happening. Yes. Wait, can I give one more hack? Yes. For a sick baby. When I have a sick baby who you're up with all night, like you're rocking and holding a sick baby all night and you start to feel yourself. Mm. I mean, I think it's easy to either kind of like bring yourself to tears when I can feel myself sort of getting escalated with a sick baby. I really need to put in earbuds and the earbuds aren't, I still hold the baby and I'm still with the sick baby, but I need to have something that kind of keeps me sane And so putting on music, putting on a podcast sort of helps remind, sort of gives me like a background music or a soundtrack to the experience that makes it easier to tolerate. Because being up all night with a crying child is soup is very hard, or I find it very hard. Yes. And but doing it to music that I listened to in high school somehow makes it easier. I do something similar. The sound piece is actually really important to me. I, even if my baby's still crying, I do like play calming sounds like piano sounds or whatever. And I do try to also be really conscious of like taking a big breath in and a big breath out. And now my child is 20 months and she'll do the same. Yeah. Really like, and there have absolutely been times where I've put her in the crib and I've just taken a break and walked outside. Absolutely. I, I did this two weeks ago. Like, Baby was crying. I was stressed. It'd been a really long night. And I literally like put her in the crib, tried to forget the fact that my neighbors were probably awake, which is the biggest thing I've had to come to terms with, with being a mom. And I just like went outside for two yes. minutes and like yes. breathing in cold air for a second. And then I went back in refresh. And it is, I, I love that you said that tip because I think that's huge. Okay. Stuff. I hate you stuff. In, you hate stuff. I hate, I hate stuff. stuff. You're incredibly good at keeping stuff in a minimum with four kids. I think there's one thing that I wanted to mention, which is like, I was about to say, don't take all the stuff that people like are giving you gift wise. Be very specific about what you put on a registry. And I would say those medicines and stuff that we just talked about, like put that on the registry, put like nursing bras on the registry. Like it doesn't have to be all cute, helpful stuff because you want to minimize the amount of things coming into your space. The other thing that is the flip side of that, that I would say is if people are offering you hand-me-downs, I have said yes to every single thing someone has offered me because I don't know what my kid's going to want and I don't know what they're going to need. And that has actually been helpful. So 
that's like a <laughs> oxymoronic. Two things can be true. Turns out, turns out both those things are true. I don't know what to tell you. That yes to, say yes to everything free, but be very specific about your registry and the things that the gifts that are coming in. And then tell me how you do the like, once the things start to build and the kid gets bigger and there's toys and they're like, do you do a one in one out? Like, how do you manage it? One in one out is great. We don't do that. There's a couple of things that I feel like this. I'm like, oh my God. Don't I'm embarrassed to say all these things out loud. Here's well, we what both I, live in like fairly small spaces. I think do. for the size of our families, I live in a two bedroom condo. Yes. And like, so it's a big part of my sanity. Yes. And stuff makes me feel so I don't like clutter is really hard for me. So a couple things. One, around Christmas and birthdays, we at we tend to ask our relatives who want to give our kids things. And we love that for experiences. We did that since the kids were really, really little. Um, like give us a membership to the children's museum, give us a membership to the zoo, give us a membership to whatever. Yeah. And, and now that they're older, they'll be like, give them a cooking class, give them a what gymnastics. And that helps cut down the stuff. The other thing is that there are, whenever we throw birthday parties, we ask them to be no gift birthday parties. One, because I just want to focus on like bringing the people together and hosting something fun and not add that stress for people. I'm bringing a gift. Um, and then we do, we do tend to, if we're giving gifts that I know are not a great fit for my child, I do tend to sort of store them in a way that then I can use that I re-gift them at other birthday parties. That is true. Yeah. Sorry, listening who's I've ever attended your child's birthday party. It was something re-gifted. I don't think people care. And you know what? The other day I got invited to a party that was like gifts. And I was like, I'm not going to bring a gift. Just like I don't buy gifts for weddings. Cause I'm like, if I go to your wedding, I'm not buying you a gift. And if you're mad at me about it, we're probably not friends anyway. Yeah. It's a, it's just so a like, horrible. yeah, I'm not bringing gifts to. Yeah. The other thing that I do is especially when my kid, when my babies were little and so they grow faster. So it's sort of like the rate of growth slows down as they get older is I next, I would keep in their room or in my bedroom. Cause it's very, all very close, a box that was for goodwill. So as soon as they put on something and I, I couldn't get it over their head, cause I put it in the goodwill box or with my older kids, I put it in the, um, save for the next child box so yeah. that I got it out of the way. Cause sometimes yeah. like those things can end up back in the laundry or I'll throw it on the floor because I'm like, Oh, I need to file this away. And then I don't. And I just keep washing it and having them try to put it on indefinitely. And yeah. so I always have that goodwill box going. I still always have a goodwill box going. And so if I'm like, okay, we've grown out of this puzzle, this doesn't fit anymore that I have something that we can give away. Yeah. Oh, I love it. This was so helpful for me, even though I get to talk to you all the time. Oh. You're the best. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. For more information about the podcast or me, go to youandmekidpod.com. See you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you or your company are looking to jump into the podcast world, now is the time. The Plug Agency is here to connect you to the full power of podcasting. You just record and leave the rest to us. The people are listening and want to hear from you. Theplug-agency.com. That's theplug-agency.com. Click the link in the episode description for an exclusive offer.